Okay, hello. Uh, welcome to DI uh, 504, uh, Foundations of Deep Learning. Uh, this is an introductory level deep learning course. Uh, and uh, this is a, a data informatics department course. So today I'm going to make an introduction to the course. I'm going to talk about the administrative stuff. Uh, what is the outline? What will we be uh, studying on? Uh, who is your teaching assistant? If there are labs or homeworks and midterms and stuff, then I'm going to make an introduction to the course regarding some um, uh, logistic stuff. Because in this course, you are going to be learning about deep learning, the fundamentals of deep learning. And uh, while you're doing that, you'll have to uh, uh, get used to some tools, actually, some deep learning tools. Deep learning is not, as you all know, something that you can do on a scratch paper. It is something that you have to work on in a sophisticated environment. And there are very different environments. So as a part of this course, I mean, one of the objectives of this course is to make you familiar with those environments as well. Frankly, there are a lot of environments and we'll be uh, making you familiar with some, some of them only, limited number of them. But in the end, um, hopefully by the end of the course, uh, having learned the fundamentals of deep learning and uh, being familiar with at least one of these environments, you'll be ready for a journey, deep learning in data informatics. Okay, let me cover my slides then. Guys, uh, this is uh, foundations of deep learning. As I told you, ah yes, about the hybrid system. I put this because I would forget the, to make that explanation. Guys, the High Council of Edu uh, Higher Education, YÖK, Yüksek Öğrenim Kurumu in Turkish, is the uh, institution who governs all the university stuff and administrative stuff of Turkey. And they have um, defined a hybrid system for this semester, which is, as they define it, 60% of the classes should be in lectures in the classroom. 60% of the lectures should be in the classroom if it is defined as hybrid. And this course is defined as hybrid, as you all know, because it's on the system, which means we'll have to make 60% of the courses in the classroom, uh, which makes roughly eight weeks because out of 14 weeks. And what I'm planning to do is, as I emailed you in the class, we're going to be in the classroom while we are simultaneously and synchronously, ah, please, uh, uh, broadcasting live on Zoom as well. And I will do my best to record them and upload them to YouTube. I'm saying I'll do my best. The reason is we've been doing this for a while now, for two years. There might be technical problems. So I'm not promising that. I'll do my best. So 90% will, it will be on YouTube, but sometimes there are problems. Sometimes this guy crashes the computer. It doesn't record and I don't have anything to put. So most probably I put them to YouTube, but I cannot promise you that. That's why I strongly recommend you attend either the Zoom session or the classroom. So this is a hybrid system. After some point, um, the last six lectures, most probably, will be online only in Zoom. And I'm guessing that it will be about late November, uh, which would, we would expect a full closure for the country. I hope it's not going to happen, but if it happens, I'll put them online. If it doesn't, it, it doesn't happen that way, if we have a chance to make a classroom lecture, we may take that chance. So I'm not closing that door, okay? This is all about the hybrid system. You had some questions about the hybrid system from the email, so that's why I uh, wanted to answer. If you have any questions in the classroom or Zoom, I can hear you, Zoom guys. Please ask it now about the hybrid system. No, I guess it's clear. Okay, you can ask anytime you want. Okay, we are going to cover uh, some fundamental concepts in deep learning. So you are going to learn what this deep learning is all about. What is its difference from machine learning? What we can do and what we cannot do with it. We are going to uh, cover some, um, such as neural networks, how to train them. And actually, um, in the end of the course, you will understand this better, but an introductory deep learning course is all about understanding high level features and how to obtain them. Because this is a data informatics course. So our perspective is we look at a data and it's vast. I mean, it's the big data, concept today is vast. As a person, as a human being, it's impossible for you to understand it. To understand data, 
as data analysts or deep learning scientists, whatever. We have to construct so-called high-level features from the data. We're going to talk about high-level features today, don't worry. And high-level features are something you do as a human being from the heart. I mean, when you look at a uh, digital picture, you don't see pixels, you see people. That's high-level fe uh, features. And actually, the revolution of deep learning, which happened about 10 years ago, was this revolution. We've learned ways to train systems that can extract high-level features from data. So we'll talk about this concept first. Okay, we can extract high-level features from data. That was the first revolution of deep learning. Then other revolutions came about sequence models, and today we are talking about transformers. Those are advanced concepts which we, we would touch. But at the fundamental and at the base level, it's about extracting features from a data. How we are going to see. So uh, the aim is, as the this is the general perspective of the institution, institute, uh, informatics institute. We are trying to bring different students, students from different backgrounds. So uh, which would lead us in this course? You will have a project. And when you're doing this project, we're expecting you to uh, be dealing with your own field of expertise. You're coming from statistics, well, find a project related to statistics. You're coming from, I don't know, civil engineering, find something related to that, okay? So, uh, and believe me, you will find a problem which is related to your field and deep learning at the same time. And there's a statistic, there's a crazy statistics, guys. Uh, half of the papers published in engineering is about deep learning today. Imagine the percentage for only computer science studies. It's something like 99%. So as a, as a species, we are trying to understand this important concept right now. So you're just taking the fundamental course for that. Okay, and um, as it was defined in the course description, maybe you've seen it in Metu catalog, basic programming skills is a must. I mean, if you cannot program in any one of the programming, uh, I mean, fundamental programming environments, uh, it will be difficult for you to pass this course. And our preferred environment will be Python. You know, it, all this deep learning, machine learning stuff is all hype around Python. There are reasons for that. But there are students who says, I don't know Python, I want to do it in MATLAB. For this course, I can accept that, but I strongly do not recommend it, okay? Because most of the newer tools, newer libraries, and newer architectures can be found in Python. And if you know MATLAB, it is very easy to get used to it in Python, okay? And uh, you're, you're very lucky, because in this course, you have a teaching assistant who is very, extremely experienced in this stuff. He's going to do, uh, be doing labs with you. He's going to be introducing these environments to you. So you have the chance of getting to know a new language. So if you say, I'm not going to use Python, well, that's your choice, but you'll be uh, missing a lot of things, okay? So he's here, by the way. Um, he's Arif Ozan. Arif Ozan will be our teaching assistant. He'll be doing you labs. He'll be giving you homeworks. Uh, about the labs and homeworks, in the following weeks, we'll talk about. Let's continue for now. Uh, and uh, for DI students, you're preferably taken data science or data informatics courses before. Because, I mean, if you haven't taken such a course, you may catch up, but it is better you do that. Or that, that, that sentence was added to the course description by the head of the department of DI, Tuba Hoca, because they believe that that should be the way courses should be taken, and they are preparing the program. That's something they uh, advice us. Okay, who should take this course? Um, anybody from any department can take this course, but there are some um, announcements that I would like to make. You may realize that there are a lot of different courses related to deep learning in this university. Electrical engineering has one, computer engineering has one, even MMI has another one. They are uh, mostly overlapping, so they are introductory deep learning courses, and I don't recommend you take multiple of them because uh, I'm, I'm not your uh, thesis supervisor and I cannot tell you anything about which courses to take, but if you are my student, I would say if you've taken one of them, you don't have to take the other ones because they are highly overlapping and go take another course, you'll learn a lot of things, but there are differences there. I mean, 
Okay. Uh, what kind of a problem in Zoom? Okay. The Zoom link is, uh, what is her name? Uh, did she make a, okay, tell her that go to, uh, she should go to my blog. Because I don't know if I can reach her. Burcu Koç, is it Burcu Koç? Burcu Koç, uh, she, she should go to my blog. Uh, blog slash aka Erdem. Aka Erdem. And there is the registration page for the other, and the, in the registration page we have it. And actually in Metu class, Otu class, in the announcements page, we also have it. Okay. Okay. So, sorry about that. What I was saying is, ah, okay, the courses. Uh, these are overlapping courses, but we are going to be dealing with different stuff. For example, the MMI version by Alp Teknoja, we'll be dealing with more vision stuff because it's related to MMI. We are going to be dealing with different applications as well. But in the end, this is an introductory level course and the fundamental concepts that you're going to learn, uh, training, neural networks, layers, back propagation, so important parts will be overlapping. So if you are an MMI EE or computer engineering student, I strongly recommend you go and take that department's course. You are not, I checked it, don't worry about it. But if you're not, and you're not, you're all not, you're welcome, more than welcome. Okay, let me continue. Um, as I told you, this is both a theoretical and a practical level course, because deep learning, since it's a, mathematical concept that is applied to some giant architectures, that should be um, practiced with. It needs a quite level of, high level of practical, which will be the labs and the projects. And I will do myself live codes in the classroom as well. So there'll be labs done by your TA, and I'll be doing some live codes as well, some, about some concepts that I feel, I think that are, that are, they are important. Okay. So good. As I told you, MATLAB is an alternative which I do not recommend. Um, and finally, uh, about the mathematical prerequisites, yes, some level of calculus and algebra is a strong requirement, guys. I, I'm going to be delving into some derivation chain rule very quickly. So if you haven't seen any calculus or the chain rule of derivatives or derivation, you will have some strong difficulty. But as I check the list, Nobody is uh, such, in such a situation. Okay. Uh, and are, there are also some weak prerequisites or co-requisites, I should have said, such as optimization and machine learning, because we are going to be talking about concepts of features or how to optimize a, a loss function. If you have taken or are taking an optimization course, it would help a lot. But there are weak requisites, uh, co-requisites, and you don't have to, but consider this as an, I don't know, uh, advice. So anybody who's taking a deep learning course, if they have taken an optimization course, that would broaden their understanding of deep learning. Okay. Uh, okay, so the outline. I'm going to be talking about introduction, which I'm going to be talking about the interactive concepts, both theoretical and practical. Then I'm going to be delving into artificial neural networks, I'll be assuming that you have never seen an artificial network before. Some of you might have, but that's the part of the course. Then I'm going to talk about what is this deep learning is all about, because there was artificial networks before 2012. Some guy, Alex Krzyzewski, did something. Before that, there, was, there were neural networks, but you weren't calling them deep. Why deep? What made them deep? And why the guys before them couldn't make them deep? So how to learn them, how to optimize them. That would be the fundamental and the core part. And we're going to be talking about high level features in more detail because I'm going to be talking about high level features today as well to give you a perspective, but we're going to be covering what are the features that we obtain, how to visualize them, and what is the relation of an output of a layer of a deep learning network to a feature. We're going to be talking about this. We're going to be talking about how to evaluate the performance of deep learning networks. We are going to make an introduction to sequence models I don't know if it makes sense right now, but um, not all data is a sequence type of data. So if you have a sequence type of data, you'll, have a, you'll need a different type of deep learning architecture. We'll see the differences at an introductory level. We're going to be delving into, at an introductory level, to NLP, natural language processing, because that's an important topic for 
DI students, then we are going to be talking about different applications of deep learning. And when I'm talking about applications of deep learning, I'm going to be talking about the application itself, how it's being applied at a systems engineer level. And also I'm going to be talking about the low level, the architecture, why that architecture is that way, what kind of a data or what kind of a problem needs, what kind of an architecture. So we'll be covering different architectures and applications and you'll see that, oh, if I'm going to be um, uh, applying deep learning to a segmentation problem, for example, I need this kind of architecture, you would say. That, that's the purpose. Well, that's the point. I heard some voices on Zoom, so are there any questions? Only I can hear you, you know that. Okay. Yeah, so that's the grading, simple. You'll have homeworks, you'll have a midterm, you'll have a final, and you'll have the project. As you can see, the uh, strongest part is the project. So we'll talk about the project, don't worry. And finals and midterms, the usual question, will they be some sort of in-classroom exams or uh, take-home exams? I haven't decided it yet. Maybe I find something in between, uh, personalized take-home exams or some some part in classroom, some part at home. We'll see about that. We'll see about the situations of the online education and stuff. But in the end, these will be the percentages for the grades. Okay, we'll start with what is deep learning. Um, deep learning is a broad subject, guys. There are a lot of, if you just, when you log in LinkedIn, Everybody says, I, I, I see that AI, ML, DL. Everybody's related to deep learning. I, I, I understand that. I mean, I'm, I'm glad that they do because I'm, I'm, I'm teaching deep learning. So uh, more people are interested in deep learning. That's something good for me. So why? Well, why? The question is why? Why is everybody trying to put DL, ML, and AI in their profiles, in their professional profiles and CVs? Because, guys, Recently, in the field of artificial intelligence, there has been a breakthrough about 10 years ago. We have realized that we could be training extreme uh, scales of data. And deep learning is all about being able to manipulate that data for certain problems yet. But the deep learning world is aggressively working on uh, trying to solve this for other problems as well. So, these, these keywords are all related. So I think everybody should see this uh, graph at least once in their lives because there are a lot of concepts and which one is the subset of which one uh, people usually don't know. So the broader title is the artificial intelligence. It goes back to the Turing machine, okay? The guys in 50s or in 80s, black screens, computer just giving you a one line uh, answer. That's also artificial intelligence, rule-based systems. Out of artificial intelligence, machine learning emerged about 30, 40 years ago. It was about models in some multidimensional spaces, trying to find some discrimination between different clusters of data. It started it this way. Then neural networks were found. Neural networks were uh, designed, which was, um, uh, inspired by the human uh, uh, neural system, then it led us to deep learning. And as you see, the fields of big data and data science are closely related to deep learning, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. But they stand close to deep learning. Okay? Because before machine learning became this popular with deep learning, the field of data science was standing a bit further from the field of artificial intelligence. They had a distance, I don't know why. Because data scientists wanted everything to be transparent. Because if you're a data scientist, people are paying you to give, uh, uh, paying you, so, I mean, uh, they want you to give some uh, information about the data which they could understand. For, for example, they are just uh, running a website. We have this data, we have the customer information. Tell us why. Well, if you want to understand why, previously, what you did was we applied statistical methods, like understanding the means and variances or more higher level statistics. So the world of 
data in science was closer to the field of statistics by then. But as deep learning grew stronger and stronger, it was an undeniable fact for data scientists as well. And they decided that we should move to this level as well. And statistics department is today is dealing with deep learning as well today. Right? This is something new. Five years ago, this was not the way. I'm sure there are statistics students in the classroom and they know this for a fact. Okay, so artificial intelligence, intelligence exhibited by machines, human intelligence. Machine learning is one of the ways to appro uh, uh, approach, uh, one of the approaches to achieve artificial intelligence, their intelligence. There are other ways, such as rule-based systems and finite state automata, other ways. Neural networks is a type of machine learning method. There are other ways. This guy, this one is inspired by human uh, system. And deep learning is a subfamily of neural networks, which is very strong and which can use, which can manipulate very large scale of data. Okay, so uh, what is the difference? Sorry, what is the difference? Data science will produce insights for us. Machine learning will produ uh, produce predictions, classifications, results for us. And artificial intelligence, which is the higher stuff, it will bring us actions. So, okay, we have machine learning stuff running the world right now, but we don't have the robots talking to us yet. It's very soon, by the way, 10 years we'll have it. Because we are very good at this. I mean, we are very good at this, but we are trying to get here, okay? Okay, these are very simple explanations, of course, but uh, if you have never thought about them, these are some insights. Okay, I'm going to be talking about machine learning first, because in order to understand what deep learning is all about, I think you should understand machine learning first. Machine learning is an application, as I told you, of artificial intelligence, which provides the systems to automatically learn and improve, the, improve from experience, from data. It's a data-based method. So for machine learning is data. I have been working in the industry uh, in previous parts of my life, and usually the customers, when I was working for a military company, uh, the customers were soldiers, and high level soldiers, high ranking soldiers, of course. It was impossible to tell them what machine learning is not. They thought that machine learning was a constant formula, such as find the target tank in this image for me, they would ask me, because that's the job they're paying for me for that one. They would imagine that there's a formula for a tank. We would write the formula in the code, and the formula will detect the tank. This is not the data-based approach, okay? Because maybe there is a formula for a tank in the infinite world of mathematics. We will never deal with that because as humans and as human-inspired artificial intelligence neural networks, we don't do it that way. When you're kids, you show your kid, that's a tank, oh, is that a tank? And he asks you something, is that a tank as well? Maybe, I don't know, it's something, it's a car. No, it's not a car, it's like, that's how we learn it, in a supervised manner. So machine learning is about a data-based approach. It is usually not always supervised. Think about the kids. They don't learn always supervised. They invent something. Daddy, I found this out. It was an unsupervised way you learn. So a data-based approach is what makes machine learning the field itself. Okay. That's why I'm explicitly saying without being explicitly programmed, okay? It's about the data. They are based on data, which is known as training data. If they are labeled, we call this supervised. If they are not labeled, we call this unsupervised. That's why they are not explicitly programmed for tasks, okay? They're programmed to learn from data. So this is another very simple, depiction of what it is. So maybe there's machine learning, there's a supervised learning, there's the unsupervised learning, and there's a reinforcement learning. At the first part of deep learning class in this course, and at all introductory level deep learning courses, we'll be dealing with the supervised stuff. What is a supervised stuff? At that's the child daddy relation. That is there a tank? No, it's not a tank. You are supervising the data training with the methodology. You should have the information. The child needs to have a dad. 
Or if the child is from the novel Lord of the Flies, that's unsupervised learning. There is no labels and he or she manages to understand the data all by himself with the methodology within. So usually unsupervised learning techniques are more sophisticated compared to supervised techniques. The revolution of deep learning, which happened about 10 years ago, which we'll be dealing deeply in this course, was a supervised method, okay? And the methods we are going to learn in this course are mainly about supervised methods. Deep learning can be applied to unsupervised methods, and there are ways for that. But this course will be generally related to supervised methods for deep learning, okay? And uh, unsupervised deep learning has a future. I mean, one of the important guys of deep learning, which is Jan Lekun. Jan Lekun is an important guy. He's, he's the head of AI research in Facebook. And he has many of the important papers I'm going to talk about him. And what he says is the next big revolution should be about unsupervised deep learning because we need systems that can understand the large scale of data without any supervision or otherwise we cannot catch up to them just like kids do. Okay, ML, ML algorithms are categorized, according to, uh, categorized this way according to how they are supervised. And there's this reinforcement learning which is something in between. Uh, and I'm going to talk about reinforcement learning in a, in a second. Let me talk about supervised and unsupervised learning. So supervised learning is the task of learning a function that maps an input to an output based on example input-output pairs. Somebody has prepared the pairs for you, okay? Somebody labeled the data for you. Somebody had annotated the data for you. And today, there are companies only for that annotation. You, have, you, you want to build up a deep learning system yourself or your company, which will automate your uh, processes, for example. You go to that company, I have this data, millions of data. Can you annotate it? That's their job, please. They annotate the data. So it's a big, important job today. And unsupervised techniques are, they learn patterns from unlabeled, untagged data. So usually in supervised learning, the common two problems we Come across is regression and classification, which will be our first concerns in this course as well. But unsupervised learning, the first common problem you solve is clustering. Because think about the data, because you are all unsupervised engines, guys. Data. When I ask you what you understand from data, the first and reflexive response you would give is, well, that part of the data seems to be clustered apart from that part of it. You are doing clustering. And that clustering will lead you to some high-level features, which we are always trying to do in AI. As intelligent beings, guys, our ability is to understand high-level concepts from signals. So unsupervised are supervised. You are doing your best as an intelligent machine to extract high-level concepts, features from data. And there is this reinforcement learning. So, uh, okay, the same. And we had reinforcement learning. And reinforcement learning is something in between. We are not going to cover this. And actually, we have a nice course from, with Elif Hoca. Maybe you've heard, if you're an MMI student, I'm sure you know, you know it. Elif Hoca uh, in MMI department uh, has a course on reinforcement learning. I strongly recommend it after taking an introductory level deep learning course. This one or Altigma just course. Anyway. Reinforcement learning is all about the agent, agent being the intelligent system to learn, to be, to be trained, learning with interaction with the environment. For example, if you want to make an agent who would play a game for you, chess game, or I don't know, StarCraft II, you create a reinforcement learning environment. It tries, see the effect, tries again, see the effect, somehow understands what the next strategy should be by the response it gets from the environment. So that logic is reinforcement environment. Again, we're not going to be dealing with this. We're going to be dealing with deep supervised learning for most of the course. Okay? Okay, so I think anybody who is dealing with machine learning and its subset deep learning should understand this workflow first. This is the workflow of, machine, of a machine learning problem. 
and I do uh, supervised thesis, master thesis, PhD thesis, and I do consult companies. What I see is most of the time they want to do nice things with deep learning or machine learning, but they do not complete this workflow properly. So guys, if you are going to be doing machine learning or deep learning, you cannot miss a single step in this workflow. It is very important, okay? The first part is data collection. Data should be collected in a um, formal way, which is designed and predefined. So you cannot just go ahead and collect that. This is an image, collect get that image. You should categorize your data. You should get a balanced number of uh, samples from each category, kind of, kind of, kind of. It will depend on the problem. Then you will need to make a pre-processing plus feature extraction from the data. What is pre-processing? I mean, maybe you have some images, I'm talking about vision, you have to make them the same size if you're going to feed it to the same machine. That's some sort of pre-processing. There are different ways of signal-based processing for vision or other types of data. Or let's not talk about vision. We are doing a DI department course right now. Let's talk about social media data, which is not a single type of data. It's a relational data, like a semantic uh, knowledge base. It's some graph representation, right? So if you're going to feed that graph representation to a machine, that ML black box machine would need some sort of processing beforehand so that each sample of data is similar to each other. For example, there's a graph here, there's another graph here. They have different number of nodes, but the black box ML models will need some the data to be in some sort of format. You will need to process the graph so that it will be some sort of representation that the ML, uh, uh, ML box, the machine learning box would understand. This is called pre-processing. Plus the feature extraction. What is feature extraction? After pre-processing, you need to carry the signals, whether it's a graph or it's pixels, sound samples, I don't know, to a higher level of representation. Because as I told you a couple of minutes ago, intelligent systems like the machines or us, we understand high level concepts. We don't see pixels, we see faces. And we see very, very high level features compared to, we don't only see faces. I'm, I'm going to have a very nice uh, picture. The amount of information we get from an image is incredible because we relate it to our previous experience and we construct very high level features. We come up with the conclusion that, oh, the, the, those two are married, kind of. How do you know that they are married? You didn't go to their wedding, but you know that. Because we can create those high level concepts. That's the feature extraction. Whatever type of feature extraction you do, deep learning based or conventional based. I'm going to be talking about what is conventional feature extraction, deep learning feature extraction. They are about carrying the data to a high level abstraction, okay? You need to do this. Because at the third step in model training, you will be dealing with high, that high level concepts. Because mathematical models, which are doing decisions on the data, need high level concepts. You as well, okay? Then model evaluation. You have trained your system, for example, how to train or get there. It's just a line right now, but you're going to learn it. Model evaluation. Is my model doing okay? You will need statistical methods for that, like cross-validation, et cetera. We're going to talk about them. And in the end, you will do some fine-tuning and parameter optimization. It's an optional uh, step, but in a proper ML workflow, in my experience, it's always a must. Okay, No system after the first training and evaluation will work fantastic. You'll have to do fine-tuning and augmentation and regularization and stuff that we're going to learn in this course. Okay. Let's talk about these feature stuff a bit more, okay? We should, that's the thing that we should understand in this course first. In machine learning, a feature is an individual memorable, uh, uh, measurable property or a characteristics of a phenomenon. It could be anything. As I told you, it could be the faces in an image or it could be a graph data if two people like each other in Facebook. There's a number of likes. Those features represent something 
I don't know, something, just like if they like each other or if they are married, which is hidden inside the data. When we are extracting features, we are trying to get that hidden information out to be provided to the machine learning system is go going to do a decision for us. Okay, I mean, if, yeah, if I'm an application is trying to just uh, get people together, if there are more likes, I'm going to show their pictures to each other more. That's a decision I should make. So that guy is going to get that data. That's why we say features are a higher level representation of raw data. So raw data, pixels, or your activities in Facebook. So feature engineering, some automatic methods. We have some meaningful features there. This is a higher representation compared to this. And feed it to the ML model. Okay? This is conventional machine learning. However, it's some, in some sense, resembles to deep learning. But before deep learning, this was what all people were doing. I, I, I was a PhD by uh, the second part of the 2000s, from 2005 to 2010. There were neural networks, but there were no deep learning by then. And this was what we were doing. We were designing algorithms to extract these features in different type of signals. In my PhD, I had done extracting features from 3D surfaces. So you say, I'll scale up the features, I'll get different scales of the surface, then I'll feed them to a disrepresentation, which would be meaningful for a machine learning system. And the papers were like, when I did this handcrafted feature engineering, the ML model made a better decision. Were the kind of thesis and the papers. Okay. So this is all about machine learning, actually. Deep learning kind of changed this fact. How? I'm getting there. So before deep learning in 2000s, the AI society of today, us, us young, focused mainly on feature engineering. It was an important stuff, which was called pattern recognition, by the way. As you all know, you have courses hanging out. I have taken, I don't know, just course, just like you all do. So it was all about finding the right handcrafted features. Okay. This was the picture I was talking about. When you show this picture to people, they would even think that those two people are married. I mean, they are models. Most probably they are photo models which have seen each other just like five minutes before the photo shots. Okay. However, they would look at ah, the girl is looking like the mother. Maybe they are married. Maybe it's their second marriage. How would you know? But you are imagining these because you have the ability to extract these high features. That's how deep learners you are, guys. So it's all about this. That's what intelligent beings do. We want the machines to be able to do it. We want the machines to understand that so that they are as intelligent as us. So we should just understand how it is done. So it is one of the main concepts of deep learning, actually. So intelligent beings understand data in higher representation, sometimes referred to as concepts, abstract concepts, features. Features can be of different levels. So a low level feature, high level features. For example, these two people being married or have they seen each other just before the photo shoot five minutes ago? This is a very high level feature. Or let me talk about a very low level feature because features come in different levels as I told you. For example, the edges. The background is white. The background, the sky which should be blue is white. And the guy's hand makes an edge. Edge. Edge is a signal level derivation actually. With the background, that's a low level feature. Finding the edges, finding the corners of an image, very low level features. Are there married, very high level features? And in between, there are different levels of features. For example, before understanding that they are married, I understood that this guy is not a monkey, he's a human being. How did I do this? Because I know what a human nose look like, human hand look like, human face look like. These are also features, human face, detecting human face detecting human, uh, I don't know, hair. These are also features, but compared to if they are married or not question, lower level, compared to the corners and the edges of the image, a higher level. So we have a very gray level scale of features, so 50 shades of features in machine learning. Okay, so 
As intelligent beings, we never see pixels, we see faces, objects, figures, actions, and relations, which is the highest level that is just married or not. Okay. Oops. When there's a break, okay, so that's a very nice example. Uh, you know, the fourth movie is coming up, so I, I hope it's going to be okay, but this is a very nice scene. Cypher is trying to say that, well, matrix data is not a data for me. I have figured out the feature extraction out of the matrix data. I, I don't know if you've seen matrix and you know the scene. In this scene, uh, Neo asks Cypher, how do you understand the data? You're just looking at some raining numbers and figures. He says, all I see is brunettes, redettes. Those are abstract little features. He has found a way to convert the raw data to abstract features. That's, that's a very nice example. Okay. Okay, so what about deep learning then? Deep learning is a continuation of pattern recognition plus machine learning. It is a class of machine learning algorithms taken from, taken from Wikipedia that uses multiple layers. What are layers? You don't know we're going to get there. To progressively extract high level features from raw input. Look guys, Wikipedia defines deep learning as a machine learning algorithm which progressively extracts higher level features from raw data. So when I told you deep learning is about extracting high level features, mostly about, because not only about, mostly about. That's a fact which is written in encyclopedias, guys. That's, that's a fact which is so much obvious that I'm, that I'm trying to say, okay? Um, so the algorithms difference from machine learning algorithms of the 20s, uh, 2000s is, in 2000s, we were the guys who designed the features. Oh, that's a very nice feature. We should use that feature. No, I have a better feature. You should use mine. That was the uh, uh, all academic field, uh, guys. Starting with deep learning, we have come up with a big machine, which is the deep learning algorithm, which extracted the features also from the data. For example, you are getting features from data. You are getting the edges. You are getting the horizontal edges. You are getting the vertical edges. You are getting the diagonal edges, for example. I'm trying to make a toy example. Well, for a problem, maybe you don't need vertical edges because what you're trying to understand is you are trying to count the vertical lines in that problem. That's the only thing you, you are supposed to do in that machine learning system. You don't need the vertical edges, right? In that case, as a supervised problem, when you study that problem in deep learning, this box will only learn to use horizontal edges because it doesn't need the other ones. That's how humans do as well, guys. If you don't teach something to kids and it, it is no use for them, they don't learn it because it's not useful. They try to optimize it always. So this is a system which encapsul sorry, encapsulates teacher extraction step as well. How oh, are we going to talk about it? But this is what deep learning versus machine learning is. It has the ability to extract high level features. So why weren't we doing this before deep learning? Because we were not able to. When you fed the raw data to machine learning model, uh, models, they simply didn't work. But deep learning models, starting with AlexNet in 2012, they made it work. That was the revolution, okay? Good, um, so why deep learning? So this guy, I strongly recommend this guy's um, courses, guys. Uh, he, what he says is, yes, you read it in a conference. Um, he, he mentions about this machine learning to deep learning transition and he gives this graph. It is, this graph is from his presentation and this is his words. So as the amount of data increased, it was difficult for us to find the necessary features. And older learning algorithms, which are not deep machine learning algorithms, have reached a plateau in success performance. But with deep learning, we could continue to get better results. So that's the simple explanation why here. So that's the YouTube uh, video. I strongly recommend you watch it. Okay, what is the application domain? 
guys, it's incredible. I mean, uh, I'm not saying that deep learning's application domain is the entire uh, space of artificial intelligence. There are still methods which should be worked with machine learning methods as well, not purely deep learning. And in those fields, we are using hybrid models. So we are using partially deep learning learn features, for example, plus some simple decision models. There are fields such that, but mostly in many different areas, deep learning is being used. And more importantly, for many different fields, many researchers right now, today, are trying to find the ways to apply deep learning to those environments. For example, like five years ago, we had AlexNet, but we couldn't, as the humanity, we didn't know how to apply sequence models properly to deep learning. Today we know, in 2007, there came the transformers. In 2020, they came, there came the vision transformers, and we are talking about sequence modeling of images and videos. So it is improving the day we sp uh, as we speak. So, okay, so what, self-driving cars, entertainment, visual recognition, and stuff. I recommend you take a careful look at this diagram, guys. Because in the end, you're going to select a project for yourself. And this project will be related to what you're doing. I'm sure you already have an opinion about your project because you're building up a thesis in your head and you want, to do, you want it to be related to DL, most probably. Um, what I recommend is, these are the titles, and if your algorithm falls or, or project idea falls under any of these titles, go make a simple Google search with that keyword, the title keyword as well. What kind of things they did? Is there a challenge for it? Because there are challenges in the internet, you know? Uh, for example, some company says, I have some corpus of data, I want to, I have some satellite images, I need to extract the trees, detect the trees in the same semantically segment, pixel wise segment, the trees in images. I have labeled them in my company. I'm trying to find a good uh, algorithm. So I put it in Kaggle. Kaggle is an environment where you can create challenges. Uh, I'm going to uh, accept all applications of algorithms and for the best one, I'm going to give you $10,000. Check if there's a challenge for the type of your, your problem, the problem that you're planning to work on. If there are papers, if there are data sets related to your problem, which are labeled, start looking for it because it will be an effort which will be a part of your project. So start doing this, start doing, uh, starting today. So uh, get, let me get back to the slides and the concepts. So deep learning algorithms extract high level features, complex abstractions based data representations through a hierarchical learning process. Hierarchical learning process, I'll get there. By extracting such features, deep learning enables the use of relatively simple linear models for supervised data analysis tests. What this sentence is trying to tell you guys, deep learning first extract abstract features, and if it can, after that, it is an easy job to make the decision. For example, you are trying to detect a cat in an image. Is a cat image. The thing you should do is maybe to detect a cat mustache or a cat fur or a cat eye or a cat tail. If you have the necessary tools to extract these, then to decide if there's a cat in the image would be easier, right? So those tools are high level feature extraction abilities of deep learning systems. So a key benefit of deep learning is the analysis and learning of massing, massive amounts of unsupervised data as well. Regarding unsupervised, unsupervised data, making it a valuable tool for data analytics. It's a good question. So I've always talked about supervised learning. How will I apply unsupervised techniques? Well, that goes hand in hand, supervised learning and unsupervised learning. I'll give you an example. For example, you have, an, you have labeled data, cat images, thousands of them cat images. Uh, or let, let me elaborate, uh, let, let me talk about something that already exists. We have AlexNet. You, you have heard about AlexNet, I guess. AlexNet is a deep learning uh, model which can classify 
a thousand categories from images. So there's a list of categories, thousand different categories. This is a cat image, this is a leopard image, this is a groom image, this is a kitchen image, this is a playground image, this is a beach image, strange list of thousand categories, okay? You just feed an image, it gives you this is a beach image, right? While trying to understand Alex, but when Alex Net was trained by millions of images from an image set, which is called the Image Net, we are going to talk about this. And it's successful. I mean, in 2012, it made a, such a breakthrough and progress, and we, we have much better models today, but it's a simple model that we're going to cover in the following weeks. That's why I'm talking about it a lot. So, in that model, somewhere in it, this guy, it's a deep learning model, and we said that deep learning models can extract high level features then this guy must be extracting high-level features from data. How would it understand if it's a beach uh, image? It must most probably be understanding what a beach is. So beach sand, maybe it can detect beach sand. So it had a, has a special part which can detect what, a, what, what beach looks like, or sea looks like, or the sea uh, sky horizon looks like. Or if it's going to detect kitchen, I think it has a some level of, uh, it's a part which can understand what a sink look like, right? So maybe if I want to apply it to an unsupervised problem, I can get only that feature extraction part of AlexNet. Apply it to the unsupervised data and look at the high level features to cluster it. And that's a way of unsupervised learning. And actually this is called transfer learning which we are going to be talking about as well. Okay, uh, so time for a break then, right? Time for a break. Um, Zoom people, Bef between the breaks, I stopped the recording and I stopped the course so that I can um, record what I've done.